الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى that he grants us benefits from knowledge and righteous actions we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increases us in knowledge this is our second session of the book Hilya Talib al-Ilm by Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid rahimahullah with the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad al Uthaymeen. this book talks about the adab of the student of knowledge the person who is seeking to benefit there must be some akhlaq that he needs to have in himself. And like we said also previously, these akhlaq are beneficial for the Muslim in general. And in today's session, inshallah, we're going to be looking at what the author has to say about how the student uh, attains his knowledge. And then in the chapter after that, Adab al-Talib ma'ashaykhi The mannerisms and the behaviorisms that the student should have with his teacher and then in the chapter after that uh, Adab al-Zumala meaning the manners and the behaviors that he should have with his colleagues and his classmates Now, this book as you can see here uh, is extremely extensive in total, it's roughly around 350 pages with his explanation and today inshallah what we'll try and do is summarize what the Sheikh has said in the book but I would refer you back to the book because there are a lot of benefits that the Sheikh mentions and I believe some of what they mean his explanation has also been translated into English the Sheikh says here al Fasl al-Thani the second chapter which is following on from what we did last week how does the student seek knowledge and how does he attain it for himself? The first thing that the Sheikh says, and what we'll try and do is put them into points. So the first point is the importance of having a syllabus. And the Sheikh says if the person doesn't have the foundations, man lam yutqin al-usul, hurim al-usul. If he doesn't have foundations, then those things which are more complex and those things that should come after he will not understand them correctly and this is really important because there are a lot of things that are happening in the Muslim Ummah today and people who haven't studied knowledge are getting involved in the complex issues when the foundations have not been established yet Masail and Aqeedah they're talking about the rulers when they don't know the basics of or they haven't studied the basics of Aqeedah Man lam yutkil al-usool hurim al-usool so the first thing that he is basically saying, and then in this chapter he goes on, is the importance of having a syllabus. And he gives us ayat to support this as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in more than one place in the Qur'an, explains to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that we have given you the Qur'an in stages. Qur'an فَرَقْنَاهُ لِتَقْرَأْ in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ tartila," Meaning, we gave it you in stages. Therefore, the Shaykh is saying here, you have to have a syllabus. And a well-known statement from the, sulam, from the Salaf, وَمَنْ رَامَ الْإِلْمْ جُمْلَةً ذَهَبَ عَنْهُ جُمْلَةً Whoever takes knowledge in one go, so say for example, he's got the capacity of learning a lot of knowledge in one go. Because he hasn't done it in stages and doesn't have a sound syllabus and he's not given himself the foundation and then the, able to, the ability to then develop on that, because he has taken it all in one go, he's attended a crash course or he's attended a conference, it will leave him in one go. The reason why is because it hasn't been taken in stages. That's the first benefit. He needs to have a syllabus. The second benefit, now this is really important. A lot of people think that knowledge is taken from books. And books are important, of course. But look what he is saying here. After you've got a syllabus and you know what it is that you need to study, so you've got something in Aqeedah, Fiqh, Hadith, etc. You need a teacher. Ala shaykhin mutqin. It is important. Fala buddha. In ta'seel wa ta'seez. For every single student, it is absolutely essential that he learns this syllabus that he's got for himself. Ala shaykhin mutqin. With a teacher 
who is capable. Now, Uthaymin, rahimahullah, adds to this, and the author is saying the same thing. Now, one of the things with the explanation of the Sheikh Muhammad is that he kind of confirms a lot of what Sheikh Bakr is saying already. And this is why it becomes easier for us to summarize it. So Sheikh Bakr Zaid will make a, a point, and Sheikh Muhammad will say the same sort of thing, but obviously in a different way. In actual fact, the explanation is longer than the book itself uh, in terms of pages and quantity. So Sheikh Muhammad has a lot to add, uh, add to it, uh, and there are a lot of benefits. But he's saying the same thing, both of them are saying the same thing, that you need a teacher. And that teacher must be somebody who is able, who is qualified, who is able to benefit you. The author says, and the Sheikh says as well, that he must be upon the manhaj of the Salaf al-Salih. And the importance of that is that obviously then you will learn the correct manhaj. You will not then be deviated. But Muthaymin adds to that by saying that when he is upon that methodology, you will be taking in from a person who has no partisanship. He's not going to give you a view because he's following a particular madhab. He's not going to give you a view because he comes from a particular uh, background or something like that. He wants and seeks the truth. So he will give you the actual view in his opinion as to what is correct. Because he's following the sound methodology. Uthaymin, rahimahullah, adds to this. That this now um, describes to us what is trustworthy. Meaning, he is qualified, it shows you that he is trustworthy, but then also that he is upon the correct methodology. Then Muthaymin rahimahullah adds to this by saying, this now also shows us the importance of not relying upon books. And he gives us four or five benefits of studying knowledge with an alim or a student of knowledge rather than you reading from books yourself. Now obviously this is really important because now I mean this book was written as it said in the introduction in 1416 some nearly 30 years ago. 30 years ago the biggest sort of advancements in technology at that time were cassettes and probably a lot of people have never even seen a cassette before. So what they mean makes reference to cassettes here. There's no internet, there's no PDF there's no social media. So what he is saying at this point is that you should be taking in from the ulama rather than going to books yourself. This is what he's saying. But obviously now we're living in a time where the fitna is far worse. And what could seem as the haq is presented to you in the wrong way. And the other way around. What is batil could be presented to you as if it is haq. And the person is going to look at that and read it and consume it in so many different ways that we have now. So the Sheikh is saying here, you need to avoid that. And the reason why is because the teacher is the person who is trustworthy. He is trustworthy because he knows what he is uh, giving you in the information, but also that he is upon the correct methodology. But then he says, another benefit to this, of having a teacher, قصر المدة and what he means by this, I mean, he, what he is saying, Qasr Mudda basically means that he will be able to take you on your journey on knowledge in the shortest duration. So by having a teacher, what could have taken 10 years for you to understand, he's going to simplify it and condense it for you. But what he actually is saying here really is that he is going to give you a syllabus. Now this is important. Some of the mashayikh that we sat with, they used to even say to the student of knowledge, this dars is not for you. We've got another dars, go to that dars, because that is better for you to attend, rather than atten atten attending this dars. And now, that, that can make sense to us all, but this is what the Shaykh is saying here. Because of the fact that you've got a teacher, the teacher is the one who is able to tell you what is suitable for yourself when you perhaps don't know it. A person might think, okay, the first thing I want to do is Kitab al -tawheed. But there are mutun and Rasail that come before Kitab al-Tawheed perhaps, that the person might even be more suited for. So what he is saying here, Qisr al-Mudda, that's another benefit. Another benefit, Qillatu takalluf The teacher will teach him in the easiest way that he will then be able to understand. 
there are a lot of terminologies, there are a lot of branches, there are a lot of uh, examples and scenarios, and there are certain things which could be uh, identical to one another, but the ruling is different. So the Sheikh is saying here, he is able to teach you in the easiest possible way. He gives you the correct opinion. Quite often when you open up a book, you might read something somewhere else. You might be uh, on different websites. You might have different uh, feeds that come up from social media. One person is saying another thing, another person is saying something completely opposite. The teacher is able to explain to you that these are the opinions. This is the correct way. Also, what they mean adds to this, so what the Sheikh is saying here, you need the teacher, but what they mean is adding to this. But the teacher is the one that will give you the delete. Perhaps you might not, not find this in other sources, but the teacher is the one that will give you the evidences. And another very important benefit that has been transmitted from the time of the Salaf is that when you come to the Majalis, you learn the akhlaq from the ulama. A lot of people have book knowledge, and as the author explains in another location in this book, that there is a difference between ilm and hikmah. And a lot of people are able to repeat back to you knowledge, but that doesn't come with akhlaq, that doesn't come with wisdom. Inshallah, perhaps we'll talk about that uh, as the book goes on. The Shaykh then says, it is important for you then to make sure that you have knowledge and studies in all of the different disciplines. Now this is also very important. Quite often a lot of people, they want to study and become a student of knowledge, but what they say is, I'm just going to focus on Quran first, or I'm just going to focus on Tajweed first, or I'm just going to focus on Arabic first. The author is saying here that that is not correct. It is important for you to spread yourself out and to benefit from all of the different disciplines. And this is true, Wallahi, I know of a person He'd been studying Arabic uh, grammar for about seven, eight years. And he said, I'm going to continue studying Arabic until I feel that I am ready. And this is precisely what the Sheikh has been saying all this time. You yourself perhaps need an external person who is more knowledgeable, who is elder, who has more wisdom, etc. To tell you, okay, you've done that, that's good, you've achieved certain things, but now you need to do something else. Focusing on one topic is not good either. Uh, if you've been studying on one topic for or one discipline for seven, eight years, uh, you know maybe you're doing it incorrectly, or maybe you know you need to you know, branch out a little bit. I mean, this is what the sheikh is basically saying here: that to focus on one discipline is not how ilm is sought. You need to have knowledge in all of the different disciplines that are beneficial and available to you. But how do you go about doing that? Number one, you need the rasail and the mutun, and he's saying here, mukhtasr fi, these shorter books in each one of these disciplines. So in aqidah, there will be short books. In uh, fiqh, there will be the smaller books. In all of these different disciplines, you're going to find that. That's the first step. The second step is to study them with the sheikh. This is his initial point to study them with a sheikh and then to become firm on them. Third thing, so now remember this chapter we're talking about how to seek in. Now this is another benefit that I wanted to mention, which is this book here is talking about the akhlaq and the adab of the Talib al-Ilm. But there are many books that have been written on this topic. What we are going to mention is basically what the sheikh is saying. But this is not all inclusive. Now this is the barakah of ilm, which is you study this book, but when you study on the same topic, another book, you're going to find other benefits that you don't find in this book. So in this book, he doesn't actually talk about what is the adab of the talib, how should he sit, how should he write, when should he attend, when he should leave, and how he should seek permission to leave, how should the sheikh sit. These have been mentioned in uh, some of other books of fiqh, but it's not been mentioned here. I'll give you an example. In some of the other books, it says that the sheikh should sit still, and he shouldn't turn right, and he shouldn't turn left, and he should be focused. And, you know, uh, he should use his hands to explain, etc. So there are certain adab that have been mentioned. As for the talib, he should sit in either the iftirash position or the murab position. And if he needs to leave, he should ask for permission. And there are certain things that have been mentioned from the adab and the akhlaq. But they've not been mentioned here. But what he is saying though, going back to the point that he's making, which is all of these different topics 
have mutun and rasail. So what you need to do is study each one of these disciplines with the shaykh and he will be able to then tell you, right, this book is the book that we're going to study now. After that, there's going to be another book. After that, there's going to be another book on the same topic. Therefore, then you're going to benefit what is in one book, what you won't find in others. Be firm in the mutun and these rasail and don't move on until you understand them well. That's the second benefit or piece of advice. The third piece of advice, and now this is again very important, which a lot of people are uh, making the mistake of getting involved with, avoid the longer books. And what he means is, avoid those issues which are above your level right now. And wait. Not because you shouldn't be studying them, it is because you need a syllabus. Ibn in his explanation, he says, this is like a person who is learning how to swim in the sea. I think you get the parable behind that. Uh, another benefit or another point after that then, is then only move on from one book after you've understood it in the best possible manner. So for example, if you've done Thalat al with one sheikh, maybe do it with another sheikh, maybe study it a couple of more times. And then when you feel that you understand it really well, then move on to another book, which might be a bit more expansive in aqid. And then the fifth sort of advice that he is giving here is capture the benefits. Now this is really important. Uh, I remember one of our mashayikh, Sheikh Abdul Karim Qudair, he says, Hafizullah, uh, that it's quite often that you're going to come across a benefit. Especially in the bigger books. I mean, how many people have the ability to go through Sahih Bukhari more than once in their life? Sahih Muslim more than once in their life? The full tafsir of the Qur'an more than once in their life? It's very difficult. So he said, if you know that this is going to be your situation, where this is an opportunity for you to benefit, then make sure you write these down. And he says, what you could even do is have a post-it with the benefit, or you can reference it in a different way so you can find the benefit. Uh, what else is also beneficial is you can have like a word document, put your benefits in there so you can control F and find it. What the Sheikh is basically saying here is capture those benefits and don't let them go. Don't rely on your memory to think, yeah, now I understood it, I'll remember it if I need it. That's not, that's not correct. The Sheikh also then says that, and he's got a lot of statements here, but this is from Ibn Arabi al-Maliki, famous Maliki scholar, that another piece of advice, and perhaps this is number six now, which is don't um, study more than one discipline at once. This is the advice of Ibn Arabi al-Maliki, he came like roughly a thousand years ago, Rahimahullah. But when Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah, in his explanation says, but this is, depends on the needs and the ability of the student. If the student is able to understand and attend and grasp more than one discipline, more than one dars, more than one halaqa, there's no harm in that. But the advice here is, is that if you are studying one thing and perhaps you're struggling with it or perhaps you want to focus on it then it is a good idea that you don't jump onto something else just yet try and understand that one first before you move on the shaykh then says uh, rahimahullah shaykh bakar in his book uh, that there is a list now i'm not going to read this list down the list is quite extensive and i think the book has been translated into english he gives a list of books that you should study when it comes to Aqeedah, Tawheed, Arabic language, Hadith, and Tafsir, and the list goes on. Usul al-Fiqh, Mustalla Hadith, etc. And this list goes on for roughly around 10 pages. So he gives a really long and comprehensive list of the books that you should acquire for yourself and study with the Sheikh, and this was his primary advice. So, what is your syllabus? So a person might ask. The syllabus can be found in the book. Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, says, 
from this list, it's important that you buy these books and study them. But whilst you are studying them, try your best to memorize them. Because this is the asal. Whatever you can memorize from these books, then you should do so because this is the, uh, this is the basis of how the ulama have studied their ilm. But if a person is not able to memorize them, or he is finding it difficult to memorize everything, then make sure, if the Prophet Amin is saying here, make sure that your notes are precise and good so that you can understand them and go back to them and refer to them and perhaps even spread them. Right. That's about syllabus, that's about teacher. What about timing? When is the best time to study? Now you will find this in this book, but you will find this in other books that the mashayikh and the ulama have recommended either before Salat al-Fajr or after Salat al-Fajr. إِنَّ نَاشِئَةَ اللَّيْلِ أَشَدُّ وَقُمُ قِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying at night time, this is when is the best time for you to uh, ponder on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore the shaykh is saying here that the majalis al-ilm should take place after Salat al-Fajr. But if that is difficult and if it's not appropriate and if it isn't suitable for everyone, then after the Salat after the obligatory prayer. And this is the manhaj he's saying here of the Salaf. In actual fact, some of the Salaf had disliked going back to sleep after Salat al-Fajr. They saw this as the time to study. They saw this as, as the time to focus. Especially now when Fajr is uh, late. Uh, you can find you know, at least half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour, where a person can sit and benefit, and they will have the hudu and, you know, the tranquility and the ease. So this is the manhaj of the salaf when it comes to this. However, this is also very important. One of the mashayikh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz al-Raji, he was asked that the salaf, they have a particular schedule. Are we supposed to follow that schedule for ourselves? So for example, the companions of Dulaim al and others, they said that we used to memorize 10 ayat and not move on until we memorized those 10. Here's another example. They used to say after Salat al-Fajr. So he said, Hafizullah, that this advice and this approach is not tawqifi, meaning this is not something that has been legislated in the religion. This isn't something that you find in the kitab or the sunnah. This is what was appropriate for them. This is what they excelled in. This is the advice that we should be following as well, because what benefited them should benefit us. However, whatever routine is better for you, because the objective is that you are able to understand and learn. So for some people, they might have the best time of the day in the afternoon. Some people might have it in the morning. Some people might have it in the evening, after work, for example. So it's important that we take note of that, because what he is saying here, after Fajr or after the obligatory prayers, but that might not necessarily be suitable. And that's not a problem if it isn't. The Sheikh then goes on to talking about how to seek ilm. Remember, this is the chapter that we're talking about. What are the things needed for us to seek in. Now in this next point, he's got a couple of statements, one from Uthman ibn Kharrazad, who passed away in 282 after Hijra, one of the ulama the Salaf. And then he's got another statement from Al-Dhahabi, Rahimullah, Imam Al-Dhahabi, and they are saying something which is very similar in talking about the characteristic of Sahibul Hadith meaning the student of knowledge. He said that the Sahib al-Hadith, Uthman ibn Qarrazad, he said, number one, he needs a good aql, aql jayyid. Number two, he needs deen. Number three, he needs dhabd. Now dhabd here is talking about precision. Number... For hadaqa, hadaqa here, Ibn Faymin says that he has to have a good understanding. And number five, he has to understand that the ilm is an amana. al Dhahabi, rahimahullah, he goes on to say something similar, that he has to be taqi, zaki, he has to be a person of taqwa, he has to be someone who's got intelligence, he has to be a zaki, a person who is, you know, clean and purified and has good intentions etc and the the excerpt is quite long but at the end of it al dhahabi says wa illa fala if he doesn't have these then he's not going to attain anything 
Ibn Taymiyyah says, then don't even try. What the Shaykh is saying here is how to seek ilm. It is important that the akhlaq and the ikhlas and the approach is correct. And what he's mentioned from Uthman ibn Jarradad is important here. Aql. And we will see later on as well, aql is one of those things which you don't really have much control of. So then what do we do about it? Dua, ibadah, ikhlas. These things increases the person in aql. There's also another bit that we will study here in you sticking to your identity. Umar Khattar, he says, learn the Arabic language because this will keep you away from maru'ah. You know, it will keep you away from bad sins and bad attitudes and bad akhlaq, etc. So there are certain things that a person can do, but primarily to become a person of aql and intellect is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then he says, Deen and Dabd and Hadaqa and Amana. Understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you an Amana. When you have these and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees this ikhlas and goodness in you, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you knowledge. One of our mashayikh, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only give khair for those people who he knows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they will use it for khair. Otherwise, he will give them something of khair as a proof against them, na'udhu billah. If Allah gives you deen, it is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that you're a person of taqwa. And you deserve it, and you're on that, on that station. And that you are going to use it to facilitate for yourself and to facilitate the deen. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you half of knowledge, half of aqeedah, half of fiqh, as a proof against you, na'udhu billah. This is exactly what happened to the munafiqun. Therefore, these characteristics are absolutely essential. Then the author says, take from a teacher and do not rely on books. Do not open up the books and think, I'm reading, it's in my language, I know what's going on here. This is a big mistake. It is absolutely essential that the person takes knowledge. Like we have said, he said that previously. And then he gives us a list of people. This is taken from Seer Alam al-Nubala by Dhahabi. There are a number of people that Imam al-Dhahabi mentions. That these people were known for ilm, but we don't know who their teachers are in history. And he gives some names, Ali ibn Ridwan al-Misri, al-Tabib, and there are some other people that he gives names of. He says, these people, they are known to have knowledge, وَلَمْ يَكُلْنُهُ Sheikh. Rather, he took all of his knowledge from books directly. And then he mentions some other examples as well. From this, the conclusion is, is that these people, this is not in the book here, but you will find this in other places, that the ulama have said that if you make the books your mashayikh, then your mistakes will be greater or more frequent than those things that you've got correct. So a person on the face of it will have a lot of knowledge. On the face of it, a lot of people have a knowledge because he's well read, he's referenced, etc. But if he doesn't have a sheikh who takes him through the journey of reading through these books, then the mistakes will be far greater than what he gets correct. al rahimahullah, one of the ulama of Sham, the imams of the Salaf, كَانَ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ كَرِيمًا This knowledge is kareem, meaning it's generous, it brings about a lot of good. يتلقاه الرجال بينهم Men learn it from men. فَلَمَّا دَخَلْ فِي الْكُتُبِ This is Razai. When you then learn it from books, and not from talaqi, not from the mashayikh, and not from durus, دَخَلَ فِيهِ غَيْرَ أَهْلِهِ Then you have introduced into this process of learning what is not the correct way of doing it. This is from one of the ulama and the imma of the salaf. Therefore, in this point, what he is saying, uh, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Bakr, uh, is that it is important that you don't rely upon your own intelligence. Especially the fact that we don't know whether what we are reading what is correct or not. Added to the fact that you've got an enemy who's going to put into you wiswas. Added to the fact that you've got all these different distractions and complexities 
that would require a teacher. But even if we take all of that away, as al Zai has said, the way that it was done from the time of the Messenger of Allah is between teacher, student, and this is how it should be done. If you do it, there'll be barakah. Fasl al-Thalith, Adab al-Talib ma shaykh the third chapter, what are the characteristics and the mannerisms and the behaviorisms from the student to the teacher? Now, the Shaykh uh, gives uh, a long list of things in one paragraph. But what he starts off by in saying is that the student must honor the Shaykh. Honor him. Give him the level of respect that he deserves. And then have manners towards him. Now again, like we said before, what is manners? Perhaps we need to study what manners are. It's not really been mentioned in this book. What he goes on to say is, when you sit, sit with respect. But what is that? When you sit, sit, uh, that you're giving him your attention. Uh, when he is talking, then listen. Don't interrupt. But I mean, these things are, I think, quite common knowledge and to be expected. But the finer details, you don't find it in this book. Perhaps for a reason, but the Sheikh has got another book uh, on the same topic, which is more extensive than this one. Perhaps he addresses it in there. But these are the things that he is saying. What are the akhlaq from the student to the teacher? Number one, honor him. Give him this uh, honor that he deserves. And then that's internally. And then externally show him the respect externally that he deserves. Have good manners towards him. And then he gives examples. So when you sit, sit with respect, sit, show that you are paying attention, uh, listen to him and don't interrupt. So if you've got a question, put your hand up, etc. Uh, if you do need to speak to him, you address him in the best possible manner. And then the author is saying here, the Sheikh is saying, just like you speak to your father, you don't say his first name. You say a name which is beloved to him in a way that you can show uh, and identify your respect of him. This is how you should address the Sheikh. Uh, if you have to talk to him and he permits you to talk to him, talk with clarity. Talk with humility. Don't um, uh, come across as if you are being argumentative or aggressive. To the point, the Sheikh mentions here, don't cut him off when he walks. Nuthaymin, rahimahullah, gives an example. He said, if the Sheikh is walking and you've got a genuine need on the other side of the Sheikh, don't cut him off like that. This is part of respect. Now this is something that you find from the time of the Salaf. The ulama, the Salaf, they used to walk behind their parents. Never would you find them saying that we would walk in front of our father or our mother. Walk behind them. Same sort of thing here. Uh, another benefit that he says is don't raise your voices in front of the Shaykh. Because this is going to harm him. I can just summarize what he is basically saying here, which is that the ulama have said that the right of the student towards the sheikh, three things. Number one, that you respect him. Number two, no harm comes from you towards him. And number three, um, perhaps respect should have been number three, but number three, you listen to him. And you follow him and you obey him. But the reason why I mention respect is because respect takes obedience and removing a harm to another level. So you basically do it in the best possible manner. Not only do you, you know, appreciate what he is doing and, and, and you accept the knowledge that he is giving and then you're not harming him in any way, but you do it in the best possible manner. But the Sheikh is continuing. He says, uh, show that you are benefiting. With surur min dars wa ifadati bih. That when the Sheikh is teaching, not only do you pay attention, this is added to the point I've just mentioned, not only are you showing that you're benefiting, but you are enjoying the lesson. What they mean adds to that, again from the adab, which are probably not mentioned so much in detail here, from the adab of sittings that the person doesn't fidget, he doesn't look right, he doesn't look left, he doesn't play with his beard, he doesn't play with his phone, you know, he doesn't become distracted about those things that are happening around. These are from the adab of the julus, but the, what the sheikh is saying here, that when you sit, you sit, that you are benefiting from him and that you are actually enjoying uh, the dars. Point number eight, if you see a mistake, 
from your sheikh. And this is really... What do you do if you see a mistake with the microphone? If you see a mistake from the sheikh, now this is important because now he talks about what's happening between... This is 30 years ago. He's talking about the, the problems that are happening within Salafia. If you see a mistake from your sheikh, if you see a mistake from your sheikh, you make excuses for him. It is absolutely a must that the student sticks to this, that he makes excuses and he makes iltizam of the respect. He, he conforms and he holds on to the respect that he has towards his sheikh. This is because the sheikh is bound to make a mistake. So then what do you do with that? You have to deal with it in the best of adab. Added to this, again, what was happening within Salafiyya, don't test the Shaykh. If you know something and you want to find out whether he knows, don't go and test him. And what mean, Rahimullah says, testing is in two ways. Either you go and ask him a question in order to test him. You know the answer. Let me see if he knows the answer. Let me see what his opinion is. Let me put him on the spot. That's not from the other. But also, what I mean, now this is happened in history, they did this with Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, when he came back to Naysabur is they said, this man is the alim of hadith let's mix up the sanad with the mutun and then relate it to him to see if he can find out mistakes Muthaymin rahimahullah is saying here, mixing what is right and wrong to then test your shaykh on purpose, this is absolutely incorrect Allah understand, you'll find this within Salafi. What do you say about such and such? What do you say about this person? What do you say about this goal? What do you say about what's your stance on this and that? Benefit number 10, seek permission before leaving. Now, Luthaymin adds to this, before leaving the dars, but also leaving the dars altogether. Meaning, you might not be benefiting from this dars, and you might think there might be another dars somewhere else, or there might be a clash in your schedule. Seek permission from your sheikh. Because it is bad akhlaq for you just to leave or that your shaykh doesn't see you anymore. But then he says, Tambihum muhim. Now, you can see the balance and you can see the aql and the wisdom of Shaykh Bakr Buzid. He said that these are probably about 10 benefits that he has said and how the uh, student should respect the, the shaykh. But now he says, pay attention. Don't behave like the people of other religions and the people of Bid'ah. In what way? Bowing. Exaggerating. Excessive praise. Kissing. To the point that we've all witnessed that when the Sheikh passes away, they go and make tawassul, what they call tawassul, or istighath, or whatever they want to call it, via the Sheikh. But whilst the Sheikh is alive, the Sheikh is saying here, Sheikh Bukhar Buzid, whilst the teacher is alive, Avoid behaving like the people of other religions and the people of Bid'ah. Right. Then the Shaykh talks about maybe another 10 or so benefits as to what is the effects of the relationship between the student and the Shaykh. And some of these are repeated. But the first thing that he says, Ratsu Malik Ayyuhat Talib, the capital assets, the most prize-worthy thing that you own, O student of knowledge, I mean, sheikh, from your sheikh, is the akhlaq that you learn from him. Is the akhlaq that you learn from him. So what are the effects between the relationship between teacher and student? Number one, you will learn akhlaq. And this is very important, like we said before. To the point that many of the salaf, they said that we used to learn akhlaq from our teacher before we used to actually learn the ilm. Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, he said that people used to sit around Imam Ahmed, the majlis used to be 3,000. 3,000 students for one majlis. And you might think that this is not possible. I've seen this myself in Riyadh, where we attended a lecture with one of the, one of the, the mashayikh. And then, you know, they have these groups, you know, mashayikh have these groups. And they said, I think there's about 5,000 people attended that one majlis. So don't think of it being far-fetched, I mean here, I mean, we're nowhere near 3,000. But Imam Ahmed, 3,000. Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, said only 500 of them were writing down hadith. 
The rest of them were learning akhlaq. Therefore, the first thing that you will learn is akhlaq. Before anything else from the disciplines. The second benefit of having this relationship and coming to durus, etc., is that you will understand the lesson and the contents better. Similar to what we said before, the Shaykh knows you. The Shaykh knows the best way for you to understand. But I would say also added to this, it's the other way as well. The student knows the Shaykh. And having that relationship is very important. If you're looking at a screen, if you're learning from tapes, if you're learning from a book, uh, sometimes the communication can easily be miscommunicated. It could be easily misinterpreted. Therefore, the second benefit here is not only the akhlaq that you will get from the shaykh, but you will be able to understand one another and that will help you in your journey in knowledge. And Uthaymeen adds to this in saying that this is true and the shaykh will only give you a lesson, give you a dars, if number one, he knows that you're ready for it and number two, that your attention is there. Now this is also very important. We've just mentioned now, after Fajr might be a good time for you to study. So you might think from tomorrow, you know what, I'm going to give this a go. But it might not work for you. So you try and you persevere and you try and you persevere. The Shaykh is the one who will be able to say, listen, we've tried it for a week, Fajr isn't working, let's try it another time. But you yourself cannot come to that conclusion sometimes. Therefore, with Ameen Rahimullah is saying here, that is another benefit from having this relationship between teacher and student. Number three, you'll be able to understand the approach of one another. I mean, this is similar to what we've just mentioned, so we don't need to repeat. Uh, but it's also important in this benefit, which is that each student has his own way of learning and each teacher has his own way of teaching. Number four, stay away from the people of bid'ah. Do not take knowledge from the people this person has become deviated in aqeedah. This person is clouded with deviancies. He gives you rulings based on his desires. And he uses his intelligence as opposed to qala Allah, qala Rasul. And you will find this. You don't even have to go to the Mu'tazila and universities and Imam Kalam. Many of the people who speak about ilm do not speak with qala Allah, qala Rasul. They will give you stories. They will say, well, once there was a person, something happened to me, something happened to that person. And the person goes away from the nas, which is the text. And... He gives you what is da'if and he bases hukum on what is da'if and he leaves off what is sahih. Ibn Mubarak, he said that we used to call these people, meaning the people of bid'ah, al-asagir. We used to call them the little ones. And Thaymeen, rahimahullah, says they used to call them the little ones, meaning the people of bid'ah. Meaning the salaf used to call the people of bid'ah al-asagir, the little ones. The reason why is because, Ibn Thaymeen says, they don't have any delay. As long as the teacher or you yourself don't have any dalil, then you haven't matured. The author, Rahimahullah, goes on talking at length on this bit here, which is actually very important, uh, but I feel that it's a separate topic as well, and we've done this topic previously, which is staying away from the people of Bid'ah not sitting with them, not taking knowledge from them, not accompanying them, not cooperating with them. Uh, it is a must that we uh, avoid them. Uh, to the point that Uthaymeen rahimahullah says, even if a person wants to learn Qur'an, even if a person wants to learn um, a non-religious sort of topic like Arabic language for example, he said, and with mean in his explanation here, that the people of Bid'ah must be avoided at all costs. To the point, this is what the author is saying here, that look what Imam Malik did. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, was asked, كيف istiwa? A person comes into the masjid, asks Imam Malik, how is the istiwa? 
And he goes on to say what he said, istiwa ma'loom, wa kayf majhul, wa imam bi wajib, wa sawal anhu bid'ah. We must believe in it. How? We don't know. And asking about it, because he could see that this person was a person of innovation, because he wanted to start a debate with Imam Malik. What is the istiwa? What's the definition? If he made istiwa, then what is about the istiwa of human, etc. Imam Malik, he said that I see you as being a person of innovation. This is the point that the Sheikh is making. These people should not be sat with. Imam Malik ordered for him to be expelled from the masjid. So what he is basically saying here is that any kind of interaction with the people of Bid'ah should be avoided. Now obviously we live in a place where that is probably not always so practical. And I think every situation needs to be examined, but this is the also. The Sheikh then, I mean, again, like I said, it's very extensive on this point, talking about Bid'ah, etc. But now going back to what we we're talking about, uh, within Salafiyyah. And Uthaymeen touches upon this, and now again, it probably wasn't at the height of it then, but the Sheikh says, today, 30 years ago, today, there are people who are indulging fi a'rad ulama. They are indulging in talking about the honor and the status of the ulama. And they rush to make them mubtadi'ah. The Sheikh says here that this is absolutely not permissible. وَغِيبَةُ ulama And making ghibah and talking about the honor of the people of knowledge, مُعْتَدٍ ظَالِمٍ This person has a, uh, transgressed and this person is an oppressor. And making ghibah of them, لَيْسَتْ كَغِيبَةُ الْعَمْ This is not like making ghibah of normal people. This is because making ghiba of the ulama and the people of knowledge has a mafsada which is far worse than just normal ghiba. And we know the severity of ghiba. The Messenger of Allah saw a companion, companion, and he says, I can see blood around your mouth. And we know the story. So if we see as this being something so bad, then what about the ulama as the Shaykh is saying here? The Shaykh says, Muthaymeen, People get involved in talking about this scholar made this mistake and that scholar said this and he said about that, this thing, etc. Number one, we should clarify with the best of respect, like we said previously. Number two, just because he makes a mistake, it doesn't make him an, a non alim anymore. In actual fact, if you look at it, this is the way of the Khawarij. You make a mistake, khalas, all your good deeds are wiped out. But also, what he goes on to say, is that you might perceive it as being a mistake, but he is more knowledgeable than you. How do you know he's actually made a mistake? How do you know that this is an, an ijtihad or position that he feels is more correct right now? فَقَدْ يَكُونَ مَا يَذُنُّهُ خَطَعَ وَقَدْ يَكُونَ سَوَابًا You might think it's a mistake, but in actual fact, he hasn't made a mistake at all. فَالْوَاجِبَ And he goes on, but then he says, فَالْوَاجِبَ What is wajib? and an obligation to the point now that if we, weren't to go, if we were to go against this, we know from the definition of what is wajib, that it's possible that the person is sinful. Tawqeerun ulama. The ulama are honored and they are given their respect and we make excuses for them if you see a mistake. And you advise them and you go and ask. Because they're still on that level uh, because of their knowledge. Another thing with Uthaymeen, as you can see this goes on, the same topic, but another thing with Uthaymeen Rahimullah talks about is what is the ruling on seeking faults? تَتَبُّ عَوْرَاتُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مُحَرَّمَةً Seeking faults in the scholar, but then also amongst yourselves, this is haram. But then he says, وَلَا سِيَمَا ulama, Especially with the ulama. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam found a group of people talking and some of the ulama of hadith have said that this was the munafiqoon the munafiqoon was sitting there talking about the companions so he comes out sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is in the Tirmidhi and uh, the Muslim of Ahmed and he said Ya ma'ashar man amana bi lisanih wa lam yakul iman qalbah O people who have believed on your tongues but iman has not entered into your hearts la taqtabu al-muslimin 
do not backbite the Muslims and do not follow their mistakes don't come and try and uncover what they've got of mistakes whoever follows their mistakes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose him if a person goes around seeking the mistakes of others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose him, even if he is sitting in his own home. Sallallahu Alaihi rahimahullah, he says that it is not permissible for us to say bad things about the ulama. We must respect them, we must advise them, we make excuses for them. Perhaps there is a reason, perhaps they made a mistake. We all make mistakes. But the fact that this person loves ilm, meaning the scholar, and he is true and he is upon the correct methodology and he is a class in this, you can't just take this away from him. Last point for today is just two pages here. It says, Al Fasl Rabi Adab Al Zumala. What are the um, uh, etiquettes and the mannerisms that we have with students, one another? So the Sheikh basically says, as friends, as colleagues, as classmates, that you should choose those people who are going to be of a good influence and stay away from people who are going to be a bad influence. Choose those who are going to get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, the author, that there are three types of friends. Sadiq manfa, Sadiq ladha, and Sadiq Fadila. Sadiq Manfa'ah, Uthaymeen explains, this person wants to get something from you. He's using you basically. You've got a friend, you've got an acquaintance. The only reason why he wants to know you is because you've got something that he wants. Once he's taken that thing from you, khalas, you won't hear from him again. Second type of friendship, Sadiq Ladha. Uthaymeen explains that this person you spend time with him and he's true to you. But the only reason why you spend time with one another is so that you can enjoy something with one another. Not that there is any particular benefit. You sit, you talk, you drink tea, you know, you socialize, that's it. Is there any benefit? Not really. Sadiq Ladha. And then the third type of friend, and this is what they mean is saying that we should have friendship with Sadiq Fadila, which is the one that is going to help you to do good and stay away from what is bad. Uthaymeen rahimahullah said, that type of friend, we can't put a number and enumerate how many benefits come from that kind of friendship. Therefore, again, like we've said before, here the Shaykh is talking about how we should be as one another in the class. And in other books you might find more detail. You should speak to each other, you should give each other the see how you should encourage one another. Umar radiallahu anhu used to go work and he was friend, he used to go to the class. And then they used to take turns and they used to swap. There's so many different things that have been mentioned in other books. But the Sheikh is basically saying here, in his advice, but you'll find different things elsewhere, which is, choose a good friend, stay away from the bad ones. The good ones, you will be able to cooperate in goodness, and you will see, inshallah, development and growth. Inshallah, next week, we are going to be looking at what the author has to say, Adab Talib Fi Hayati al uh, how is he in his life, in his routine, in seeking knowledge? And in there, inshallah, he talks about a number of benefits that inshallah we can benefit from. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us of the people of ilm and beneficial knowledge and righteous actions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes this knowledge and this religion as a proof for us and not against us. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates us through this deen and that he elevates the deen through us. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين بارك الله فيكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك